And the children are welcome to go back to Sunday school. Will you pray with me? Great God, as we read from your word, we pray for wisdom and understanding. Help us to be free from our past prejudice and experience and be open to hearing from you this morning. Amen. This morning I'm going to be reading out of Ephesians chapter 2. We've been reading a lot the last few weeks out of Paul's writings. You remember that Ephesians is one of those little books, um, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, that are right there in the middle of the New Testament. So I'm going to be reading out of Ephesians 2, starting with verse 11. And before I start reading, there's going to be a lot of weird stuff in the scripture. (laughs) But don't worry, we're going to get into it and explain it, okay? All right, here we go. So then, remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. Jesus has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So Jesus came and proclaimed peace to you who are far off and peace to those of you who are near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers or aliens, You are citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, in Jesus, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom you also were built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So you see what I mean? There's a lot of weird stuff in there. But we're going to get into it. We're going to talk about it today. Now over the last few weeks, you might notice our fella on the wall here. Over the last few weeks, we have been talking about the body of Christ. Really, we've been talking about unity, haven't we? And how each one of these people represents each one of us. Now if you don't have a person up there, please come and get a person from me after church and we will add you to the wall. But each one of us is an individual with our own things, our own likes, dislikes, our own characteristics, our own qualities. But together, we make up the body of Christ. And that's what we've been talking about. Unity. Working together. The people of God are better together. We're better when we work together. We're better when we get along with each other. We're better when we recognize that it's not any one of us that is more important than the other, but that Christ is the head. We function better when we are unified. We carry out God's purposes better when we are unified. And according to the scripture we read today, when we are unified, we become a dwelling place for God. We become a people who share the presence of God. But unity is a challenge. And that's why we've been talking about it for over a month now. Our natural inclination is not to be unified. How do I know that? because I've been alive for more than a day, right? (laughs) You know that our natural inclination as human beings is not to be unified. We can argue about anything. We can disagree about anything, right? When we're feeling cranky, it doesn't even 
doesn't have to be anything big. So our natural inclination is not to be unified, but unity is not just a challenge for us in 2017. This has been something that has been a problem for the people of God for the entirety of the history of the people of God. And we see that in the beginning of this scripture. But it's this reason that we've discussed is that there, there is only one thing that brings us together. And what is that? Jesus. Jesus. That's the one thing that we all have in common. Other than that, we have so many differences, right? Age. We've got somebody in there who's four months old. We've got people up in their 80s. We're not going to point out people or name names. But we've got, we've got the gamut, right? <laughs> Vivian wants to point out people in their <laughs> <laughs> we like different football teams. I mean, on Steelers Browns Day, right? We've got half the church over here, half the church over there. And then Miss Viola and I got off on a separate off on a separate course with the 49ers. Our education is different. <coughs> Our ways of functioning are different. The way we grew up is different. Our parenting style is different. Our genders are different. And on and on and on. I could just name so many things that make us separated, that differentiate us. But Christ draws us into him. And being drawn into Christ, we're drawn into each other. The salvation that Jesus brings connects us not only to God, but to God's people. The, other, the people living in Jesus' time had differences too. One of those differences that gets a little lost in translation is the idea of the Jew and the Gentile, the circumcised and the uncircumcised. And you may be thinking, how do they even know? What is, why do they care? What's going on here? And, but the fact is, is that this was a major point of contention with the people of God. At that time, it was causing some major divisions with the Christ followers. Now, the mention of this circumcision and uncircumcision and blood in Israel probably seems pretty strange um, and maybe even a little too graphic to talk about in church. But, honestly, you don't need to know a whole lot about it. This is what you need to know. Ancient Judaism saw circumcision as the primary symbol of obedience to God's law and being pure. So, those who were circumcised thought that they were better than all the others. And that idea is behind the introduction to our scripture today, okay? So you don't need to know all the other details about what's going on here. That's what you need to know. The people who were circumcised said, we are better. We're God's people. We're following the law. And so it was a great source of division. The uncircumcised weren't even allowed in the temple. They weren't even allowed to be, and at the temple, if you read in the Old Testament and Exodus, back in those crazy Old Testament books, you'll read that the temple is the place where God could dwell. So the uncircumcised weren't even allowed in the place where they thought God could dwell. That's how bad things were. Okay, So we've got this huge division between the people of God. And even though Jesus had said, I come for the Jew and the Gentile. There's still this big division. And so Paul comes in to Ephesus and he says, look, you are still not getting it. Which seems to be what Paul says a lot, right? Yeah. In a lot of his books. Corinthians, <laughs> Romans, Ephesians. You're still not getting it, guys and gals. And while circumcision may no longer be a focus for division for us in 2017, the problem that's described here is a deeply rooted human problem. Alienation, division, name calling, separation. And as long as those problems continue in the church, there will be sins that accompany it. Envy, hatred, lying, conflict, abuse, and on and on and on. And so we know that the division is not good for the church. It's not good for the body of Christ. 
So we see Christ breaks down this division. That's what it says as you continue to read in the scripture. He gets rid of the division because Christ came to save all people. So Christ not only joins the Jews and the Gentiles together, he ushers them into one body, into God's presence. The two groups are made one, it says. The purpose of this new being is the creation of peace and unity. And it is, and in the division, in it, the division and the name calling that started off the scripture is supposed to be ended. All people who come to Christ are God's people. That's what Paul is saying. And God's people are God's temple. <clears throat> so what you see happening here? Okay, a temple is the place where, Old Testament, temple is the place where God can dwell. And now Paul is saying, you are the temple. So people who were not even allowed in the temple are now being called the temple, the place where God can dwell. Isn't that awesome? Thanks, Vivian. <laughs> it is. It's awesome. It's, it's a belonging that never happened before. Before Christ. And that's why it says in verse 14 and 15, Jesus made the two into one. He destroyed the barrier. They were saying, yeah, you can be Jesus followers over there in your uncircumcised state, but you're still over there. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. There is no circumcised and uncircumcised. There's no Jew. There's no Gentile. There is one. One in Christ. You are all one. It's this beautiful picture of unity. Jesus came to bring salvation to all people. Verse 21 says, in Jesus, the whole building, temple, people of God, is joined together and becomes the temple of the Lord. So we've been talking about, for the last several weeks, the body of Christ with Christ as the head, right? Christ is our head. And Paul comes here and calls the people of God a building, with Christ as the cornerstone. So we could do a whole other picture, we're not going to, where we're each stones, right? And Christ is the cornerstone. The idea is the same, you understand. That we are one, we are one unit, we are one body, we are one building, with Christ as the foundation, Christ as the head, right? And at the end of the scripture, there's this kind of statement of fact. Because of this, when you become one, because there's no divisions, you all are a dwelling place in which God lives. Now, sometimes scripture challenges us or asks something of us. This scripture is more of a description, a goal to achieve as the people of God. In this scripture, we see the nature of the church, right? Unity, the destruction of division, access, belonging, reconciliation, all of those terms are used in the scripture. But what's really being said is this. If you can function, people of God, if you can function in unity, despite all of your distinctions and differences, you will be a dwelling place for God. That despite your many differences thing is what makes it so hard, though, isn't it? It's why we spent so much talking about it, because it's our natural struggle. And differenti differentiation is necessary for identity. But the human tendency to create barriers is sin. Distinction and uniqueness do not have to lead to division. But they often do, don't they? We create barriers between Nations and religions and races and genders and denominations and schools and communities and families. And really any place that we can put up a barrier, we do. The creation of these barriers, though, results from the way we attribute value. That is by devaluing those who are different. So while distinction isn't sin, division and barriers are. And Paul says, this should not be because don't you all know Jesus Christ? Can't you get rid of all this other stuff because you know Jesus Christ? <clears throat> the theology in the scripture defies that human tendency for barriers. It is a theology of unity in which the barrier between Jew and Gentile, between male and female, 
between Browns fans and Steelers fans <laughs> is destroyed. And the oneness is created. And I, I joke, but you know that that is a hard barrier to cross. First time. First time. <laughs> While we may not fully understand the Jew and the Gentile separation, our world is filled with barriers we do understand that keep us separated. But God does not show favoritism. Genesis reminds us that we were all created in God's image all created for God's purposes. And here we see that God's purpose for us is unity. Any barrier that divides humanity was destroyed at the cross when Jesus died, one for all. Any barrier was destroyed at the cross. And what Christ has destroyed, how dare we keep in place? We cannot love our barriers so much that we ignore the word of God. Christ destroyed any barrier, any division, any separation, and created unity. And God's description of reality really ought to be the one by which we live. The markers that define us and give distinction must give way to the one determining marker that brings us together, and that is Jesus Christ. The other distinctions may be real, but they don't have to define us or separate us. Christ must be our strongest defining characteristic. When we are focused on Jesus and Jesus at the center of our lives and the center of our focus, we will be drawn to everyone else and we can understand unity. Herb, what's one thing that we are different about, you and me? Just one, I know there's a lot. <laughs> anything. Anything. Not anything. Politics, yeah? Yeah. Herb and I are pretty different in politics. You can't fly a plane. I can't fly a plane, that's true. I, I just need one, I just need one from oh. Herb. <laughs> just one. There's a lot, I know. But Herb, we love each other, don't we? <laughs> I think so. I love you. I'm a hard to love person someday. You're not. You're not. The thing that brought us together, though. What's the thing that brought us together? God. 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 Absolutely. Ashley, what's one thing that we're different about? We're both young women, right? Look, so Herb is a, is a fella. You're a lady. Okay, so there's some similarities, but what's one thing that we're different about? How about age? I'm almost twice your age. But what's one thing that brings us together? God. Mary Alice, what about you? It's always God. It's always God who brings us together. That's everything. The beginning, the end. That He's there for us all the time. And, and, and I take all this time. <laughs> I'm, I'm a prayer. Um, I, I just, all the time. And it's God that brings I'm, us I'm, together. I'm all fine with that. You're all fine with that. I'm all fine with all right. that. Anything else that isn't happening, it's because it's it's not his time for mm -hmm. it. And I, my patience is required in that. But that doesn't mean I don't believe in him anytime there's a big weight. Okay. Thanks, Mary Alice. Kenny? I'm a male, you're a female. <laughs> <laughs> That's one. So what draws us together? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. I could talk to every single one of you in this room. There's differences. For some of us, there's a lot of differences. But you know what? We're drawn together in Christ. Because when we come together to the cross, when we come alone to the cross, there are others there who are there because of Jesus Christ. And so we are drawn together. We are drawn together because of Christ. That is the one thing that draws us together. 
the purpose of the physical temple. Now, let's get into this dwelling place, okay? Because we've talked about unity. We've talked about unity for weeks. And at this point, I hope you understand how important unity is. We've talked about it, talked about it, talked about it. So what does it mean to be a dwelling place for God? Well, the purpose of the physical temple in Jerusalem, if you look at the Old Testament, was to show that God had taken up residence with his people. Now, <clears throat> that was in the temple, the physical temple. In the New Testament, the dwelling place for God is no longer a physical place. It's why I say so often, this is not the church. We are the church. Okay, And we say that, and we say that, and we say that, but it's hard to get that really into our minds. The temple is no longer a structure. It is the people of God. We, we are a temple of the Lord. A place where God dwells. A place where God lives. The people, okay, people make up the body. Each one of us individually make up the body. We're each a part. We're each a stone. A living stone that makes up the building in which God dwells. Christ is the cornerstone. Now, cornerstones today oftentimes are pretty are symbolic. They don't actually hold the entire building together. Have you ever seen a building that's got like this real pretty like cornerstone on it? Okay. That's not what this is talking about when it talks about Jesus as the cornerstone. It's talking about those enormous huge stones that used to be the foundation for the building. And that's what Jesus is. Jesus is our foundation. He's our head. He's our foundation. Why are we to be a dwelling place for God? There are people in the world who do not know Jesus Christ. The purpose of the church is to be a place where people can meet God. And until we function in unity, we cannot have be a dwelling place for God. And until we're a dwelling place for God, how are we going to help people to meet Him? There are people who are not saved. Maybe there are people in this room who are not saved. Who don't understand that Jesus came to save us from sin. And all of this, weeks of talking about unity, is not just for the purpose of unity. It's for the purpose of the fact that there are people who need to know who God is, who need the saving life of Jesus Christ. And until we can become a dwelling place, a place where God is present, a place where people can see God and meet God, we can't fulfill our purpose as the church. That's what all of this has been about. We have to be a dwelling place for God, a place where people can <coughs> find salvation. There is a, an old song, I don't know how old it is, honestly. It's called, You're the Only Jesus. And it says this, You're the only Jesus some may ever see. You're the only words of life some may ever hear. There are people who will never walk into a church. It doesn't matter what you do, what kind of event you throw, how you make it enticing. There are people who will never come into a church. There are people who will never open a Bible. And you literally may be the only way that they ever see Jesus, that they ever see hope, that they ever see that love that Jesus can bring. And so you have to be a dwelling place for God. A living, walking, dwelling place for the Almighty God so that God can meet the people in the world who need to meet Him. That's why. That's why we have to do this. Life in Christ means unity with God and unity with others. And the result of that union is a place where God decides to reside. 
We are going to take communion this morning.